Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the Pop Rewind podcast of poprewind.com. I'm Lee. And I'm Linz. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing all things Virtual Boy, the infamous Nintendo system that never happened. That was sort of happened, but we didn't want it to. We aren't supposed to talk about it. <laughs> it's like Nintendo Club instead of Fight Club. Yeah, uh, first rule of Virtual Boy Club is there is no Virtual Boy. If only. Yeah. So let's back up. Um, We're going to assume that you haven't played one before, even though you probably have and forgot about it. Virtual Boy. Locked it out. Which, you know, is fair for some people's opinion on the system. Uh, The Virtual Boy was a portable system that you stuck to your face, right? Yeah, and it wasn't really, like, portable with quotes around it, I would say. Because it's not like you could pick it up and hang out with it like a Game Boy. You had to set it on a table on a stand and then place your face into it. So it's not really conducive to car rides. Right, right. Yeah, It. Uh, what were the graphics like in this? Would you compare them to, you know, Game Gear? I think they were more like Game Boy, but red in 3D. Yeah, I think it was more like a glorified laser uh, pointer. (laughs) That's one way to put it. (laughs) Uh, They were, it was red LED, and the reason it was red and not color was because red was the cheapest LED thing you could get. So Nintendo wanted to make the system affordable, which is commendable. Like, you don't want it to be $800. Fair. But, and I guess they did some testing with color, and it was kind of jumpy, and so they went with what they could basically which i mean i i could i am very hard on the virtual boy but i commend them for trying well why was it red why wasn't it green or blue or you know red was just the cheapest wow you know people yeah. people got so bent up on everything being red on the system but is that really different than game boy i mean it's not like well, you had the it's... color palette there yeah <laughs> and people never really complained about game boy either they loved that you know, I was always baffled by the Game Boy's success compared to what else was coming out around that time. I mean, Game Boy definitely had the market share, but not too long later, we had the Game Gear, which to me was just yeah. like infinitely the better system. And I had both, and I played Game Gear way more often. I liked the games better, the graphics, everything. I guess it's just kind of what your parents bought you at the time. And since Game Boy was out first, you just kind of stuck with it. That's the only thing I can think of because, yeah, Game Gear was looked way better. Yeah, by far. And, you know, you actually had games that resembled the versions on the home consoles, especially if you were a Master System user. They were basically the same games. Right. And then if you're a Genesis user, eventually the Nomad came out. Exactly, exactly. Which was uh, was the handheld Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive. For some oh, yes. listeners, um, it was a portable system for that. But let's let's jump back to Virtual Boy. Okay, so Virtual Boy came out in August of 1995. Yes, the was supposedly a 32-bit system. That's what they say. Okay, now why did this thing come out? I mean, maybe was this exactly what they intended? Uh, I don't know if it was what they originally had planned it seemed from what i was reading that it was just something one of the r&d teams were playing around with and it wasn't supposed to be released it was more like an experiment that they were doing while another r&d team worked on the n64 okay so who who was the mastermind at nintendo Uh, that would have been gunpei yokoi who actually invented the game boy which we were just talking about and the game and watch so he had a pretty good track record at nintendo in terms of a great track record yeah yeah so what what happened here oh gosh so many things (laughs) yeah this thing it just seems like it got rushed into release and maybe it, it wasn't really intended to ever be anything more than a tech demo that's what it feels like playing a virtual boy sometimes and going, I was on a couple different Virtual Boy fan sites, I, I guess you can say fan sites, and they had tech demos for, you know, Star Fox game and a couple other big name games that never came out. Yeah, that's so interesting. So it's interesting that, yeah, I, I always wondered if they had, some, kind of like with the Saturn, if they had that big name game 
like a Star Fox on there or a Donkey Kong uh, Country, would that have saved the system? Well, you know, it very well could have. I mean, obviously with the Sega Saturn, people feel Sonic Extreme could have saved that system, but it went into endless development and never came out. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it looked like a great game. So, it did. So with the Virtual Boy... What was it like playing one? Describe this process for people. Well, for me, I didn't play it when it first came out. I missed out on that. I don't remember even seeing advertising back in 95 for it. I don't know if that was just because I'm Canadian or what, but uh, I got one second hand. A buddy of mine was selling his and three games for like 15 bucks. So and I got that. You got probably ripped about, off. <laughs> I got that probably around 2000 or so, 2001. And it was... I put in Mario Tennis and I placed my face into this thing and it was just like red laser beams at my retinas. Yeah. It was, I played for maybe five, ten minutes and then the headache set in and the eye strain set in and that was actually one of the warnings. Right, right. That you could experience, you know, the headaches, the eye strain, you have to take frequent breaks. The breaks are built into the game. I mean, that that should tell you something. Yeah, every 15 minutes, there's this optional setting to make you take a break. That's, I think if you need to stop playing after 15 minutes, that's, maybe it shouldn't have been released. That seems really hazardous. Right, right. But it was awful, like, just the headache and the eye strain. I only played it the once. I still have it. It's in my basement. Uh, Don't foresee me playing it again. And then shortly after, I needed glasses. You know, that's interesting. Um, A year after I got my Virtual Boy... I end up getting glasses. I wonder if that's a common theme amongst Virtual Boy owners. It probably is. Now, did you get yours when it was still, I guess, fresh? I kind of had this habit of buying systems once I knew they had gone under so that I could get them cheap. And, you know, they basically were just giveaways at that point. So I bought the Virtual Boy in 97 after it already had been officially discontinued. KB KB Toy Store, if you remember that place, the mall was just unloading these things and i think i bought the virtual boy and like four games for 70 bucks and i had done that same thing with my 32x and later the dreamcast so this is just sort of a you know one of my little plans to get cheap games i guess Uh, that's a smart move yeah yeah especially for ones you really you know aren't that hyped about um i do kind of feel like i missed out on the dreamcast but the 32x not so much so um Yeah, you know, there were not that many games for the system. I think there were 14 in the U.S., 22 worldwide. Yeah, uh, 19 in Japan, 14 in North America, and then 22, I guess, different ones. So there's, I guess, no overlap. Well, not a whole lot of overlap between the U.S. and Japan for games. But there are there's a big market for homebrew games on the Virtual Boy, which really surprised me. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to go through the effort of making a homebrew game, I would never have guessed that you would put the efforts into Virtual Boy. No, uh, Virtual Boy has maintained a strong following, and people are, are just really into that system. And Yeah, I mean, it's it was a nice initiative. Definitely, definitely. But I don't think it translated all that well. No, and um, I will back up a little bit. A lot of the games, I think, were... Uh, like. There was a Japanese version and then the U.S. one. And so that's where that count varies. There might have been, like, golf in the U.S., but then there was, like, virtual golf in Japan, but they were the same game. Oh, yeah. okay, I see. Yeah. I actually ended up buying a few Japanese games for my Virtual Boy. Like, years later, some store at the mall was unloading some imports, and they're, like, three bucks a piece. And I'm like, eh, why not? None of them were good. It was, like, golf, <laughs> baseball and i think red alarm okay which is an okay game now did you have a favorite virtual boy game it's not like they're my favorite games but if you had to pick of these 14 games which ones were worth (laughs) playing uh, i would recommend the following 3d tetris it was a unique take on tetris at that time um galactic pinball was actually pretty good mario clash which was kind of like a 3d version of the old arcade mario game nestor's funky bowling which it might actually still be my favorite bowling game ever. And then, uh, wow. yeah, the cutscenes are just ridiculous. They get mad if you only knock down nine pins. 
and then get a spare. That's... They're still upset. And I'm like, you know, that's pretty good compared to my actual no bowling. No kidding. And, and uh, you know, I think most people would argue that uh, Wario Land is the best game for Virtual Boy because it was actually a real game. There were levels. There were things to do. You could play it for so more that than one minutes. was. That one was like an actual platformer then? Yeah, yeah. It was as close as we got to, you know, a Mario game on the system, definitely. Um, and kind of a lost title in the Wario Land series. Wow. Yeah, because I noticed a lot of different puzzle games, which I guess is would be good for the 15-minute limit. Right. You know, you play a game of Tetris, and then you go lay down for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... Um, Going back to Nintendo, how did they handle this? Did they think the system was a success, or were they just like, no, let's quietly get rid of it? It was, like, brushed under the rug. Um, well, as we had mentioned before, it came out in August of 1995. By early 1996, so mere months later, this oh thing gosh. was abandoned. Completely. So, yeah, so I'm surprised you got yours in 97. I thought they would have, you know, sent it off to the E.T. graveyard in New Mexico. <laughs> Maybe. KB was just hanging on to their stock in case it came <laughs> back in. <laughs> they were cleaning out the back room. We're like, oh, crap. Totally. So what uh, what happened to the developer of this thing? Uh, he, there's some conflicting rumors. Some say that Nintendo was just pissed at him and wanted him gone. Others say that, you know, he left on his own accord and they still have a good, well, they still had a good relationship. Uh, right. But he did go on to develop Bandai's Wonderswan handheld device, which never made it to North America, but was, I guess, relatively successful in Japan. It was up against Game Boy Advance, so it wasn't you know, the forerunner in it. That's tough competition. But there was a little yeah. window of time there because that was probably after Game Gear and definitely Nomad, I think, unfortunately, never really caught on. So that was kind of phased out. So there there was a chance for something else to enter the market, probably. I think game or, uh, Nintendo came out so quickly with Game Boy Advance at that time that it didn't really stand much of a chance. But the, uh, the Wonder Swan does look good, and I always wanted one, and I was always disappointed it never made its way over here. No, and I, I looked it up. There seemed to be a decent number of titles for that system, too. Yeah, they had some Final Fantasies on there. They had oh, wow. some good-looking games, yeah. Okay, so that might be one worth picking up someday. One day, when I learn Japanese and, can and play, play Final play Fantasy games. games. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, it's not going to be good. Oh, well, that's, that's a bummer. Um, so, you know, Virtual Boy wasn't, I think, when people think 3D gaming, instantly the gamers all think Virtual Boy, oh boy, here we go again. But it wasn't the first, the only, or the last. Um, there were other other things. I'd like to say before Virtual Boy came out, there, Nintendo had already done a little bit of 3D and Sega as well. Did you know that? Oh, that's the uh, Sega VR prototype. Well, that was that was a little bit later, even earlier. Oh, there were uh, Sega Scope 3D, where these 3D glasses you could plug into the Master System and play oh, a few right. times. Yeah, and then uh, Famicom actually had something very similar, the Famicom 3D system. Now, have you ever used those glasses? No. Oh. And neither did, did anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> apparently um, that seems accurate yeah yeah i kind of like the master system ones i think they work with um, space harrier and that's a fun game okay yeah, tiger. yeah that'd be neat to have did you ever play that tiger um version of the virtual boy it was kind of like their their little competition toward it aimed more in the like 30 to 50 dollar market probably no, was, was it another one where you had to prop it up on a table, or did it actually strap to your face? I believe this one strapped to your face. It was called the R Zone, and okay, the commercials made it look like you're gonna go into the R Zone, but it was actually more. I mean, you've played those handheld tiger games. It's just like the LCD yeah. pixels jumping over a pre matted background, and it was basically more of that. I it's like playing a game on your calculator watch. Yeah, yeah, you're not that far off, which I loved those <laughs> those game watches as a kid. But not 3D or reality in any no any sense of the word. No. Um yeah, the Sega VR. That was something interesting. I liked the look of that. I was always bummed it never came out. 
Yeah, and they were supposed to have one for the Saturn as well, but that never happened either. No, no, I guess... But it's interesting because uh, I guess Sega dropped the project in 94 because they claimed that the virtual reality effect was too realistic and that users might move while wearing the headset and injure themselves. And after we saw what the Virtual Boy was, I don't see that being a problem for Sega. I'm having, uh, you know, I just envisioned Sega being like, hmm, maybe this just isn't really worth putting on the market. And Nintendo's like, ha ha ha, we'll move yeah. forward. <laughs> like, maybe Sega, for once, was playing it safe. I mean... No kidding. I, at that point, I think you've already had the Sega CD out, and I don't remember offhand when 32X was released, but probably around that same time, and then Saturn yeah. and the, the mess that brought that organization down, basically. Yeah, it is interesting that you mentioned, you know, Sega played it safe, and for once, Nintendo did not, and this is kind of like that black mark on their record. Yeah, it's like this in the Super Mario Brothers movie. They just don't get brought up in the Nintendo circle. We never speak of these. No. I'd like to see the uh, the Virtual Boy games come out on 3DS. You know, maybe buy a set that has all the games in it or something, or the that download would be store. Interesting. I don't... Have you played a 3DS before? Uh, only, like, the store demos. I don't own one at this time. I've got one, and I always turn the 3D off. So not really so worth I guess having. like. No, I probably could have stuck with the regular DS. Or you can get the uh, the 2DS. Yes, the Speak and Spell Edition. Yeah, it's just like 3D is not working for Nintendo. And I think releasing something like the 2DS maybe just is like their way of acknowledging. Yep, moving on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the fact that they play around with the technology, but it's not... I don't know. For me, I'm sure there's other people out there who love the 3D effect. For me, I'm not really into it. Right. Well, like I said, the uh, the Virtual Boy at times feels like a tech demo. And there's this clip on YouTube where you can watch a tech demo of the Virtual Boy kind of being unveiled for the first time. And nobody's really that excited about it until Mario jumps into a different layer in the in the graphics it like moves to the other side of the screen and everybody's like whoa man dude and it's just like people are losing their minds over this that yeah i did see that and it kind of reminded me of those um fighting games like even i think hyperstone heist ninja turtles hyperstone heist you could move back and forth yeah so to me it wasn't that mind-blowing yeah and there's others um I can't, I'm blanking on the names, but there's other fighting type games where you're just walking through and you can move up and down and left to right. Yeah. So I don't think it was, I mean, it's neat and I'm glad they played around with it, but it wasn't breaking technology or anything. No, no. Um, it, re- it really didn't feel like it at the time. You know, we've, we've talked about kind of some of the, uh, the complaints or, or negatives of the Virtual Boy. What about positives? Is there anything you do like about the Virtual Boy? Um, you know, I started off this podcast in my mind thinking, I'm going to be nice. And then the first thing I said, I totally dissed on Virtual Boy. <laughs> yeah, you totally derailed it. I had this whole, you should see my layout of notes here. It goes from, say, say a few <laughs> things everybody already knows about the Virtual Boy, and then say something positive. And that didn't happen yet. Oops. But, you know, like I, I've said, uh, I'm glad they played around the technology, and I respect Nintendo for that. Um, it, it was different. It was definitely different. And like you said with that Wario uh, Land demo, yeah, it was neat to see. Yeah, definitely. Um, what do you think of the controller for the Virtual Boy? Um, I, well, I've only played it for about 15 minutes in my life and i didn't mind it it wasn't i mean when i think of bad controllers i automatically think first xbox (laughs) wow so this i mean that's it's a fine controller were you a fan of it i was i gotta say it might possibly be my favorite controller for any gaming system really yeah if there's any one thing that i just feel like the virtual boy did right that controller it's just like it's got a good grip it's basically it's got the dual handle thing like you'd see on the PlayStation controllers, but you could wrap your whole hand around it and there were trigger buttons on the back and um, it was just, you could turn on and off the system from the controller, which maybe isn't that groundbreaking today, but that was kind of nice oh, then. Yeah. Yeah. While your head's inside this thing, you didn't like <laughs> look 
looked like you know something was wrong with you trying to like reach around for buttons on the system no that would have been a mess you just been like tipping that thing over oh totally did you ever play the virtual boy in public no i thankfully i was in the discretion of my own home no one saw me playing it <laughs> you made sure the curtains were closed <laughs> <laughs> don't look um I I have played the Virtual Boy in public. It gathered a lot of attention, which was like, it made you feel cool for the first five minutes, but then it got really irritating when you're trying to play a game, then you like pop out for your 15 minute break and there's a crowd around you. You're like, whoa. Well, yeah. I, I mean, you, it's not like someone can watch you play. They're just kind of watching your face in this thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, um, I was on a plane once with somebody that was playing Virtual Boy and people just gathered around like what is that what's he doing what's going on and um i once i once had my virtual boy um i I had it out playing and somebody knocked it over and broke the stand and so mine like always fell off the stand after that that was kind of the end of my virtual boy can you just put it on like a stack of books well sometimes i just like lay it on the floor and bury my face in it and that was kind of weird. <laughs> but I can't imagine taking that on a plane. Yeah. I've, it's not really compact. No. I've, you know, they pull down the, like, tray and they're playing it. I don't know what that would look like. <laughs> you know, I'm sure it happened. You know, people take that thing on a plane. But how would that look today if somebody just brought out the Virtual Boy and was like, right, I'm going to play I think mm, not the, good. No, but then you know you've got things like the uh, uh, these other three D systems coming out, the Oculus Rift, and it's like, is that really any different? Are we going to see people on planes with that uh, tablet on their face? Maybe that Sega VR will finally come out. Oh, uh, let's only hope. I I don't know if I've ever told you this. I discovered the Sega VR on a plane. It uh, was advertised, or there was a write up about it in one of those sky magazines or something similar and so i'm just like you know like if you're on a long flight you can read your book for the first hour and then after that you're like ah what else is there to do and you, yeah. op- you open up this catalog and one of them had that that like one picture of the sega vr in there the virtual boy is such an isolating experience yeah uh it's i mean with game boy obviously it's a one player thing but you could get a cord and hook it up to another one and there were multiplayer games right there, but not so much for Virtual Boy. Surprisingly, there was a tap so you could do multiplayer, and a couple games had that planned, but the uh, the multiplayer was taken out. The tap never, the tap cable never came out, and uh, I think that's why I liked Nestor's Funky Bowling. It's because you could play it with somebody, you'd bowl you around, and then hand the controller off. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to do multiplayer. Let's stri- like so it was abandoned before the Virtual Boy even got out there. Or they just saw that it wasn't doing well in the first couple months and decided yeah, against it. I'm thinking that's probably the case. So if you look on the bottom of the Virtual Boy, I think there's a port that says like EXT or something. Ah. Uh. Yeah. And the uh, I remember my neighbors got a Virtual Boy. This was my first time playing one. Like we all kind of heard rumors they were going to Toys R Us that night and they were coming home with something big. And, <laughs> and they they came home with the Virtual Boy, and it was like kind of. You know, you're excited. Wow, I'm going to have to try it. This is the one. And it's sort of anticlimactic because only one person can play it at a time. And so, you know, it wasn't a very social experience. And while they do it, you just like go in the other room, watch a movie with someone else. And it was just, yeah. Because, I mean, even if you could hook it up to your TV so other people would watch it, it, you're not getting the 3D effect. Yeah, it... uh, it, I don't think Virtual Boy would work without the 3D effect. Right. No, definitely not. So, you know, Nintendo didn't really give this thing a chance to breathe. Um, you know, like you said, they discontinued it. You didn't have one at the time, but did you know that it had such a, such a short shelf life? I think before, shortly before I got mine, um, so late 90s, I may have started reading up on it but i didn't realize it was that that short or that that much of i guess a fail for nintendo right right i uh, i feel like it's kind of a slap in the face for people that ponied up and bought this thing i mean well yeah i mean full price i think it was 199 
Yeah, it wasn't a cheap system. And, um, no. you know, unless you're me and you bought it later. But even I felt kind of ripped off knowing, like, I'm paying all this money for something that's, like, gone. Yeah, you're not getting any other games besides those, you know, 14 or 19 or whatever it was that we right. ended up with. Well, some of those are impossible to find. They're just, like, there weren't that many printed. Um, I know you were kind of amused looking through the title list for Virtual Boy by one of the games that was on the system. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, video games have movie tie-ins. Right, And right. one for the Virtual Boy would be Waterworld, which, given how much of a fail that movie was, I thought was appropriate that they would come out for the Virtual Boy. And uh, the fun part of that is I've never seen Waterworld. Um, however, I own the game for Virtual Boy. <laughs> so how is it? I know Nestor's Bowling is up there for you, but how would you rate Waterworld for the Virtual Boy? Very boring it's uh you're like in this boat and you're shooting at guys on jet skis and there are these dudes drowning all around you but you don't really rescue them and i don't know if maybe that's the plot of the movie and that's why the movie was such a failure but um the game doesn't make any sense yeah i've never seen Waterworld, but what you described is pretty much what i pictured yeah yeah basically just a bunch of people in the water and jet skis yep yeah <laughs> and kevin costner yeah oh you know i just i feel like the the virtual boy has kind of an unfair reputation as being this total garbage system but i really think a lot of that blame just comes from the obviously way too early release of this thing and the cancellation like i i think it could have been something more because nintendo had this kind of this tradition of like releasing the next version of something and it was always more impressive you know like think about the the first DS, that thing felt like a prototype. And then... Oh, yeah. You know, like the DSi came out and the XL. And those were good good systems. And... Uh, yeah. It got sleek because I, I have um, one of the original DSs and it is clunky. Yeah. But then you get the sleek DSis and or the 3D. it's all so nice. Yeah, it's nice. So I would have liked to have seen the second round of Virtual Boy. And I just feel like there wasn't enough chance for it to catch on with the public. Yeah, it is kind of sad they only gave it a couple months. Yeah. I mean, you need a little more time than that. I think you would need a little more time than that to determine whether or not it's a worthwhile product. Well, and they gave people a little bit of time to try to figure out if it was a worthwhile product with some uh, marketing tie-ins. Oh, yeah, that's right. They had that Blockbuster and NBC tie-in where if you went to Blockbuster to rent the system, um, you would get a $10 credit to go and buy it. But once you rented it, you kind of saw what it's like, and you don't really want to use that credit to begin with. So the garbage cans at Blockbuster were just filled with $10 worth of coupons <laughs> yeah. for Virtual Boy. Yeah. Wow. Do you think anything could have been done to save this system? I, I wonder if they had a bigger game, if that would have helped, or if they gave it more time, or you know, not only more time on the market, but more time in development. Yeah, definitely. It definitely needed that. I I just, uh, like I said, I'd really like to have seen the system take off, and it just didn't happen. Well, I mean, you always want to see it. You you want to see Nintendo succeed. You don't want to, unless you're Sega, I guess, you don't want to <laughs> see them fail miserably. So if the usual phrase was, Sega does what Nintendo, how would you reverse it in this case? Nintendo does what Sega was actually smart enough to not do. Yeah, see, that should have been the tagline that Sega it went with. It was catchy. Did you catch all that? That was that just rolled off the, the tongue, The too. Saturn would have been a hit. I, I was interested to learn that it, the uh, Virtual Boy was a 32-bit system, because I always thought it was weird that they kind of went from SNES to the N64. Yes. They kind of skipped the 32-bit while, you know, uh, Sony and Sega and Atari sort of, that's... Do the right. math, whatever. You know, they had their 32-bit systems. It's a stopgap. I mean, if you look at the detail in the pixels of this game, or in the system, you really see that the graphics had potential. They're nice. They're a step up. But I, the shading thing, I think they're just relying way too much on that single color. And maybe yeah. there should have been an $800 version of the system for people that were like, you know what, let's get the full color one. Well, we've got the 3DS now, and nah. Nah. So we're maybe it's just not meant to be. Maybe not. 
Well, as as we wrap up here, are there anything else you want to say about the Virtual Boy? Any recommendations you have based on the topic? Uh, recommendations? Uh, try not to play one. If you do play one, just make an appointment with your eye doctor now. That's uh, that's probably some kind of advice. You know, <laughs> my recommendation would be if, if you do play the Virtual Boy, um, you know, give Wario Land a try or Nestor's Funky Bowling, but uh, not Waterworld. You don't no. want to play that. No, you don't want to mm. play that game. Uh, all right all right well hey everyone thanks again for listening to the pop rewind podcast brought to you by pop i have been lee i have been Linz, and we both own virtual boys thanks for listening bye pop rewind.com <laughs>